We're going to come to a time now in the service. We're going to look at a passage from the Bible. We're just going to talk about what it means, why it matters, and what we should do about it. So if you have a Bible, would you turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning at verse 10. Matthew 13, beginning at verse 10. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. If you're using this Brown Pew Bible in front of you, it's on page 690. And when you found that, would you stand together with me? I want to read this passage. So Matthew writes this. The disciples came to him, that is Jesus, came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Just across the paragraph, verse 34 now. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let me pray for us once more and just ask God's blessing now and this time together in his word. Father, now we just ask you to open up our eyes and our ears to hear your word and understand what you've written here. We believe centuries ago you inspired men by your spirit to write these words down. So more than just some kind of ancient document here, we have a living word, something that can speak to us still even today. We ask you to speak through it to our hearts. You know where each person in this room is this morning. I don't. But I'm asking that this would speak directly to the needs, to the questions, to whatever it is on the hearts and minds of each person here present, just as you've spoken to me this week as I prepared this. I ask you to use it to accomplish your purposes. You tell us whenever you send out your word, it doesn't return to you a void. It accomplishes the purpose for which you send it. God, accomplish that purpose in each one of us today. And as I always ask, eternal God, would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth? Amen. Stories. We see them everywhere, and they're a part of pretty much everything we do in life. Stories, they're the thing that makes sitting in a dark room with like a hundred other people for two and a half hours plus, staring at a screen, uh, binge watching an entire season of This Is Us over the weekend, makes those things seem totally normal, totally reasonable things to do. Stories are the kind of things that can lull you to a peaceful sleep after a long day of work, or they can help take a really complicated subject and make it quite simple and understandable to a child. We find stories in our music, in our advertising. We find stories in our boardrooms and around campfires. They're they're everywhere. Some of my most fond memories as a child are listening to my mother's voice read us stories Now, my fondest memories are listening to my mother read those same stories to my kids. The story, says Ursula Le Guin, from Rumpelstiltskin all the way to War and Peace, is one of the basic tools invented by the human mind for the purpose of understanding. There have been great societies that did not use the wheel, she says, but there have been no societies that did not tell stories. Jesus himself knew the power of story well, and he used it frequently and memorably in order to illustrate some of the deep spiritual truths that he wanted to bring about and teach about in his earthly ministry. In fact, even today, 
Someone who's never stepped foot inside a church, someone who has never even opened a Bible, will still sometimes use the familiar language of Jesus' stories. Uh, uh, an uncommon rescuer you'll describe as the good, a good Samaritan. Uh, a rebellious child going through a hard time. Sometimes the parents will describe them as a prodigal son, prodigal daughter. We use this same language from Jesus' stories just in our everyday speaking. We're beginning this new teaching series today, this morning, called Stories of the Kingdom, looking at some of Jesus' more well-known stories that he told, often referred to as parables. That's the kind of common language he used to describe them. If you look today at newspaper headlines, you know, like an airport or in a grocery store, those headlines are telling the story of that kingdom, the story of that city. They're telling you what it's like. They're telling you what's valued there as well as what's despised. Well, I'm saying in the same way, the parables of Jesus in the gospel accounts that we have in the New Testament are one of the ways that Jesus tells us the story of the coming kingdom of heaven, a kingdom that he inaugurated with his coming and that will be fully realized when he returns one day, telling us the story of God's kingdom, what's valued there as well as what's despised. This morning, what we'll be looking at in Matthew 13, you may have already noticed, uh, there isn't a story there. Uh, don't freak out. This is more beginning. We're beginning the stages here to, to set us up well to enter into the stories. This is more introductory in nature, but I'm saying this is vitally important. We, we need to begin here in order to be able to understand the depth of what Jesus is trying to communicate in these stories when we do start to encounter his stories of the kingdom in the coming weeks. That's why we're starting here before digging into the stories. Let me explain what I mean. If you've ever confronted someone about something they've done wrong, it doesn't matter if they're a child or an adult, whoever it is, very often it's pretty much guaranteed that they are going to want to give you their side of the story, right? They're going to want to give you their account of what happened, even if it seems like pretty obvious what the truth is. They're going to be like, well, wait, you got to hear my side. You haven't heard my side of this story. No, they're actually, they're going to say, you can't even understand this story fully. Or you can't fairly judge what's going on unless you've heard their side of it. So, that's what I'm saying. Uh, they, we, we, we often see this happening, and in fairness, it's true. When we look at the surface, we're just looking at the, the case, we often don't see the whole truth. We don't see the fullness of what's going on just on the surface. It's why we have common phrases in our language like, don't judge a book by its cover. It's why uh, when you have eyewitness accounts in court cases, oftentimes they, they can be wildly different stories. And it's why the killer at the end of a murder mystery rarely turns out to be who you thought it was at the beginning of the story. We, we, we need to, for the most part, hear both sides of the story before being able to come to an accurate picture of whatever it is we're looking at. Well, given that reality, what I'm saying is we dare not embark on a series talking about the stories, Jesus' stories of the kingdom, before we understand Jesus' side of the story. Before we understand what, what he says about these stories and, and why he chose stories parables as one of his primary methods of teaching when he talked to the crowds. Why did he do that? Now, if you ask anyone who even knows that Jesus taught in parables, they're going to tell you Jesus' parables were, were this. They were about taking deep spiritual truths and presenting them in a simple story form so that everybody could understand them. Often you'll hear them set, set as like they're earthly stories with heavenly meaning. This is what we think Parables are about, that's what someone will tell you. Oh, there's stories to understand deep spiritual truths. And on the one hand, that's absolutely correct. But when Jesus is asked the exact same question, his answer, ironically, points out and highlights an even deeper problem that the people in Jesus' day had and that we share with them today as well. Namely, how it is that we approach Jesus to begin with. Because just put aside Jesus' teaching methods for a minute. It doesn't, we're not even necessarily talking about that for a second. Our picture of Jesus himself is often much more simplistic than the biblical reality. We come to Jesus and we, we see him as far too much like us. 
He's far too human. He's far too reachable with our own intellects. We, we think we pretty much got Jesus figured out. He goes here. He goes in this box. We got Jesus figured out. I mean, the Pharisees are a classic example of this kind of thinking. They just thought, okay, that's Jesus. That's his thing. We'll respond like this. They, they thought he had him figured out. And one of the places where that overly simplistic view and belief about Jesus shows up more noticeably than in today is in the way we understand and look at Jesus' parables. The way we understand what these stories of the kingdom are. We see them very often as nothing more than just kind of a moralistic fairy tale. Kind of like Aesop's fables, right? Slow and steady wins the race. Prodigal son comes home. You know, kind of around the same Level. We just see them as like tales with a, a good moral. And not only that, we also see them as told by just kind of some sort of old historic like rabbi from the Middle East telling stories with like farming, shepherding analogies. I mean, they're just simple, right? Straightforward stories. You know, nice. They're nice. But think about this for a minute. If Jesus himself has two natures, that is, the person of Jesus is both fully human and fully God at the same time. That's the Bible's answer of who Jesus is. He's God in human flesh. That's who Jesus is. If he has two natures, it shouldn't really surprise us to find that his teaching could also have two natures. That there would be a simple, easily understood level, and then also a much deeper spiritual level that can only be understood through revelation. Something you can't just figure out on your own. I believe that's exactly what Jesus is getting at here in our passage this morning and his answer as to why he spoke teaching with these parables. And when we understand both sides of the story, all of a sudden we're confronted with a much more difficult reality. And a much more complex, impenetrable picture of who Jesus is as well that will not submit to our reason and logic. So as we look at our passage this morning in Matthew 13, for the sake of argument, I'm going to presume upon our answer as to why Jesus taught in parables. It's going to presume upon that, and we're going to spend our time looking particularly at Jesus' answer as to why he taught this way, why he taught using stories. And understanding both sides of the story, then, I think, as I said, I think we'll then be much better equipped going ahead to understand Jesus' stories of the kingdom as we encounter them in the coming weeks. So this is setting us up well for the rest of the series, I hope. And as we look at Jesus' side of the story here, I want to look at our passage this morning in just, just two ways with us. First of all, I want to show you parables as a means of concealing truth, and then Parables as a means of revealing truth. These two things. Parables as a means of concealing and revealing truth. So if you've closed your Bibles, would you open them again, please, to this same passage in Matthew 13. Follow along with me as we look now at both sides of the story. So let's look first of all at parables as a means of concealing truth. Parables as a means of concealing truth. Now, The context for this whole discussion going on here is immediately following some of Jesus' teaching down by a lake. In verse 2 of this same passage, chapter, there there was a large crowd gathered to hear Jesus, so large that he actually had to go out in a little boat on the lake a few uh, yards out, and then the crowd all stood on the shore. There was just so many pressing in, he couldn't even get to, to, to teach to everyone. And this is the context where Jesus first gives the parable of the sower, sower scattering his seed. Now look with me at verse 10, beginning of our passage. There we read this. The disciples came to him and asked him, why do you speak to the people in parables? Now, it's more implied in Matthew's gospel, but in Mark's account, Mark is one of the other gospel writers, in his recounting of this exact same event, he tells us that Jesus' disciples asked him this question later on. They, they took him aside later on. When the crowds had gone home, this is where they're asking him this question in private. But if you look at Jesus' initial response in verse 11, already it's clear there's more going on underneath the surface than what we're hearing at first. Look with me there. Jesus replies, verse 11, 
The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Now, by to you, Jesus means his disciples. To you has been given this knowledge, and by them, Jesus means the crowds that he was just speaking to. Okay? To you is his disciples, them is the crowds. And what Jesus reveals in his initial response, first of all, is that the parables are intended to reveal the secrets of the kingdom. Great. Great. Okay, that's very much in line. If you grew up in church, that's very much in line with what we understand the parables to be. Why? They're helping us to understand what what the kingdom of heaven is like. Great. But what it also reveals is that Jesus is not intending to reveal that knowledge to everyone. Which for most of us is already different than what we're used to hearing, isn't it? And like the disciples, we hear that and we're left wondering, wait, wait, sorry, what? Why, why wouldn't Jesus want to reveal that same knowledge to everyone? But before there's even much time to consider that question, Jesus goes on in verse 12. Look with me there. He says, whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, what he, even what he has, uh, Luke uh, records that says, even what he thinks he has will be taken from him. Jesus' difficult implication now being the ones I give this knowledge to are going to be given even more. If you have the knowledge, you're going to be getting even more, and the ones I'm not giving it to, even what they think they have, is going to be taken away from them. Again, like this, this sounds radically different than the Jesus many of us are familiar with or the simplistic, straightforward understanding of Jesus' parables that many of us hold kind of challenges our common view of what these parables are. Finally, look at verse 13. Jesus answers the question now much more straightforwardly, and he says this, this is why I speak to them in parables. Okay, here we go. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Now, New International Version of this scriptures we're reading from here uses this word, uh, he says, uh, I speak this to them in parables, Though they do not see, or although, although they see, they don't see. Although they hear, they're not hearing in his response, which is actually a paraphrase of the quotation from Isaiah that he gives in the next verses. Now, some more literal kind of word-for-word translations say the word Matthew uses here is actually because. Jesus says, I'm speaking to them in parables because seeing, they don't see. Because hearing, they don't hear, which makes Jesus' use of parables more of a response, a response to the hardness of heart of his listeners. But if we look at this same event in the other Gospels, both Mark and Luke recount Jesus saying it this way, this is why I speak to them in parables, so that seeing they do not see, so that hearing they do not hear. However you understand it, however, whichever one of these you go with, the clear response in all three examples is still, Jesus is saying, I'm teaching them in parables so they won't understand me. Uh, okay, my, my youngest daughter is about to begin uh, a late French immersion program next year, grade six. While without a shadow of a doubt, she's going to encounter Things, moving from an English program to a French program, she's going to encounter things she won't understand. But I think it's a safe bet to say that there's not a single teacher in that school who's going to say, I'm speaking to your daughter in French so she won't understand me. (laughs) They're not going to say that. Yeah, it's going to be difficult to understand initially, but the point of immersing her in the language is so that eventually she will understand. But what in the world do we do with a teacher whose stated intent is that he's knowingly teaching a large section of the people he's talking to so that they won't understand him? What do you make of a Jesus who appears to discriminate between his listeners in such a seemingly arbitrary manner? Are you starting to see now why we need to hear both sides of this story before we just jump right into a series on the stories of the kingdom? There's more going on here than we initially thought. It sounds like madness to it. It sounds even cruel of Jesus to act in this way. But thankfully, the relief comes, I think, in the next 
verses. Look at verse 14 and 15 now. Jesus says, In them the prophecy uh, is fulfilled, the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Now, two things we learn from this that are going to help us understand what Jesus is up to here with this concealing of the truth. Stay with me. First of all, verse 14. Jesus begins by stating, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Who's, who's them? What? The crowds, right. Them is the crowds. In the crowds, within this mass of crowds, in them is fulfilled this prophecy of Isaiah. Okay, what's this prophecy of Isaiah that Jesus speaks of here? It refers back to a message that Isaiah, this prophet, was given by God all the way back in Isaiah 6. And Jesus actually quotes directly from the message that Isaiah was to give to God's people. But if you're not familiar with the ministry of Isaiah, what you wouldn't know is that when God called Isaiah to be his prophet, to speak these words to his people, he called Isaiah to bring a message to a people that had all but turned their back on God. A people who had turned away from him to follow their own path, which included the worship of other gods. A people that God was about to send into exile as punishment. That's who Isaiah was speaking to with this message. So putting this all together, what Jesus is saying here is that the majority of the people in this crowd that he was talking to, including many of the religious leaders of the day, were as rebellious, were as hardened in their hearts towards God as the people of, in, of Israel in Isaiah's day. They both were completely shut off and closed off to God, and that's why he's bringing this message to them. Like, sure, they all came out in droves. Huge crowds came out to hear Jesus, but they came out more for the show, right? They came out to see the magic show where Jesus is going to perform tricks, raise people from the dead. He's going to heal people. You, you draw a big crowd with that. Or they came out to see a polarizing leader who, who they hoped might fulfill their political hopes of a restored kingdom of Israel. They came out for that, but they had this, this same group also rejected Jesus out of hand as the Messiah. Well, he, he's, he's not from God. He's not the Messiah. But yeah, let's go out and see the show. This is interesting. And Jesus says this, because they came out with hearts that were closed off to him, this is why he speaks to them in parables. Now, which is it? Who got it right? Is Jesus speaking to them in parables because their hearts are hardened towards him or so that their hearts will be hardened? Which is it? The answer is yes. Yes, that's right. It's, it's both. They're both right. Rather than presenting different conflicting testimonies of what Jesus said, the gospel writers are just highlighting different sides of the same truth as to why Jesus would speak to the crowds in parables. Well, this is hard for us. This is hard to, this is different than what a lot of us have heard. Even if this is the first time you're encountering it, this sounds wrong. But before we just leap to any wrong conclusions about what's being said here, we need to clearly see the heart of God in the midst of all this, expressed through Isaiah as well as through Jesus here. And you see it in the second half of verse 15. Look there. This part that's added in, you, you can't lose sight of this. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. Here we see that the heart of God for humanity, living in rebellion towards him then as well as today, is that they would see. His desire is that they would hear, that they would turn to him, and by turning to him and understanding that they would be healed. That's the heart of God for people living in rebellion towards him. Heal us of sin that separates us from him, as well as heal us from the results of living a life in opposition to him. That's the true heart of God behind this concealment of the truth. We can't lose sight of that, or all of a sudden God, Jesus looks like this jerk who's just discriminating against people. That's not what he's doing. His desire is that they would hear, that they would 
turn. Leon Morris, in his commentary on these verses, writes it this way. Sin is a disease, and the people of whom Jesus speaks decline to be healed of it. No, thank you. We're good. Using the imagery of eyes that refuse to see and ears that refuse to hear, he rebukes people who refuse to heed God's gracious invitation and choose to go their own way. So the call of us in this passage today as we encounter the words of this very same God in our Bibles is this. Will you turn? Will you turn to me at last, says God to you this morning. Will you turn to me and be healed? Will you surrender the rule of your life? Which includes, will you surrender all your plans, your, your goals, all the ways that seem right to you about how to set up your life and instead open yourself to the one who created you and the one who knows what is truly best for you? Will you turn to him? If you look at your own life this morning, I don't know where you're at this morning. Look at your own life. Does God seem distant from you? Does he seem far away? Do his words seem difficult to understand, his commands impossible to carry out? The reason could be that, although you know God in a thousand different ways, you're still living out your life in opposition to him. You could absolutely still be doing it. You're trying to follow your own game plan. This is how I'm going to do my life. I'm just going to hand God the completed list and say, will you just sign off on that? That's that's living a life in opposition to him. He is the one directing our lives, not us. Or maybe there's still areas in your life that Jesus isn't allowed to speak into, he's not allowed to touch, rooms he's not allowed to go into. Jesus isn't allowed to tell me about how I spend my money, not allowed to tell me about how I should live in my marriage, how I should parent my kids. That's my business. That's living a life in opposition to him. Later in Isaiah 65, God says to this same servant, listen, all day long I have held up my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways that are not good, pursuing their own imaginations. People who continually provoke me to my face. Jesus isn't discriminating against these crowds then in our passage, and he's not, discriminating, he's not discriminating against you either. Even in our rebellious provocation of him to his face, he's reaching out to us. He's reaching out to you still. Won't you turn to him and find healing today? As the author of Hebrews tells us, Hebrews chapter 3, listen. As the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years I saw what they did. That is why I was angry with that generation and I said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That Rest, that, that healing, that knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom, they're all available to you now this morning. They're available to you, but they require the surrender of your heart. They require the surrender of your agenda, your, your illusion of self-sufficiency to him. Do that, says Jesus, and these can all truly be yours as well. Okay, so that's parables as a means of concealing the truth. Again, not a discriminatory act of Jesus, but a loving discipline in the hopes that people living in opposition to him might turn and be healed. Last thing I want us to see quickly here this morning is parables as a means of revealing the truth. Parables as a means of revealing the truth. Now here at last, okay, this is something we're maybe a little bit more familiar with, a little bit closer to our understanding of what we've always commonly held the belief of what these parables are. Jesus is using a story to help us understand the secrets of his kingdom more deeply. And to a large degree, that's correct understanding. And yet, even here, I think 
Jesus' response to his disciples' question there in verse 10 just needs to be nuanced still a little bit more. So let's look at it. His response now in verse 16 and 17. Look there. After the difficult words of these previous verses regarding concealing the truth to the crowds, whose hearts are hardened towards him, Jesus now says to his disciples this, But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Beautiful contrast to the eyes that do not see, the ears that do not hear. Jesus tells his disciples their eyes and ears are blessed. Why? Because they do see. Because they do hear, which points us all the way back to verses 11 and 12 in our passage, where in contrast to the unbelieving crowds, Jesus told his disciples the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven had been given to them. They'd been revealed to them along with the promise that to all who have that knowledge, even more will be given. Jesus says, you think this is good? There's even more coming. More than you could ever imagine. There's more coming. But there's two things in particular I want to draw out for us here that I think help us understand how and why Jesus' parables are a means of revealing truth. First of all, When you look closely at Jesus, what he says in verse 11 as well as in verse 12, you see the language that Jesus uses for the knowledge that his disciples have about the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. It's all revelatory language. That is, this knowledge isn't something that they've come to on their own, but something that was given to them. Knowledge that was given to them as they turned to Jesus, as they increasingly put their faith in him. Simple uh, evidence of this in action is the very next verses immediately after our passage where Jesus pulls his disciples aside and explains to them what this parable of the sower means. He's like, let me tell you now what this parable is about. And that's actually the consistent pattern of the parables. Jesus, he, he preaches the parable to a big crowd, then he pulls the disciples aside afterwards. And he's like, let me explain to you what it means. Let me tell you what's going on here. Uh, another example of this would be Peter's confession of Jesus. Uh, a couple chapters later in Matthew 16, Jesus uh, people, is asked, saying, who do people say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the, the Holy One, the Messiah. What does Jesus do? Does he come over and give Peter a big high five? Yeah, bro, you totally figured it out. Nice. Nope. What does he say to him? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven point then as well as today is the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven comes not from our being smart enough or clever enough to figure it out. It comes not from being able to decipher the secret code of the parables, but listen, it comes solely from how it is that we're related to Jesus, the revealer of God's truth. This leads us perfectly to the second thing I want you to see here. When you look more closely at Jesus' words of blessing in verse 17 of the passage, The question that needs to be asked there is, what was it that Jesus' disciples saw and heard that the patriarchs, prophets, holy men of the past had longed to see and hear? What was it? Was it to hear Jesus teaching about the coming kingdom in parables? Is that what they longed to see? Was it Jesus' miracles, seeing that, demonstrating the inbreaking of his kingly rule over sickness and death? Was this, were they all just, they'd all had the recording and they'd never got to see the band live? Is that what this was? No. What all heaven had been longing to see and hear was this moment in history. They'd all longed to look ahead and see what the Apostle Paul calls in Galatians 4, the fullness of time, when God would send forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law. The time when God's promised rescuer, promised all the way back in Genesis 3, would at last come. Would at last come and begin to set right all that was lost when sin entered into God's good creation. That's what they'd all long to see. When is it going to happen? When is it going to be here? And now here it was. Maybe you're familiar with uh, Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well. John chapter 4, she's speaking with him, and at the end of the discussion, she says, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. See, there's an understanding. He's the one who's going to come and reveal truth. He's going to show us 
what this is. We've all looking forward to this time. And then Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. I am the one who's come to reveal truth. It was as Jesus' disciples remained in relationship with this promised one that their eyes were opened and their ears were opened to hear and to see what generations before them had longed to look on. They were getting to see it firsthand, front row seats. The point for you and I today is to remember that greater knowledge greater understanding of God's word, as well as his perfect will for our lives, comes as we seek to live in submission to and pursuit of Jesus. Just as a life lived in unbelief and rejection of him brings about the opposite. Why? Because Jesus is the revealer of God's truth. He's the one that reveals it. We don't come to it on our own. We need it to be revealed to us book of Jeremiah, uh, another one of God's well-known prophets like Isaiah, he said it this way, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, the revealer of God's truth. So yes, Parables, they they do reveal more about the kingdom of heaven. They reveal what it's like, and they do use the power of story to help us understand some of the deep mysteries of God more clearly. They do that, but we must never lose sight of the fact that the point of Jesus' parables was never that we would know and seek to interpret the details of the story better and better. Don't focus on the story. That our goal and our aim would always be to know Jesus better. For it's only as we are related more and more closely with him that we are given the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom. And he says we're given them in greater and greater abundance. I don't know where this is sitting with you this morning as we talk through this. It's different. But I hope you see at least how essential it was we begin here, looking at both sides of the stories of the kingdom, what we commonly understand the stories to be, as well as what Jesus says his purpose was in giving us these parables. For this is now going to shape and direct how it is that we look at and encounter each of Jesus' stories of the kingdom as we look at them in the following weeks now. Because I think you're going to see that it's a profoundly different experience when we come to Jesus and his stories with a proper perspective, as well as a proper humility. Understanding, first of all, Jesus' stories being a means of both revealing God's truth as well as as concealing it, to see that going on when we look at the stories. Also, that we approach the one speaking those stories not as some simplistic rabbi telling simplistic folk tales that we could easily grasp on our own. But seeing the one telling these stories as the God of the universe in human flesh. Speaking secrets of his kingdom that are so vast, so deep, so profound, that we wouldn't have a hope of understanding unless that knowledge was given to us. But remember, alongside having that right perspective, there's also a promise for us already. A promise for us as we encounter these stories. A life in pursuit of and submission to Jesus, a life focused on Him, will grant us that knowledge, will grant us the knowledge of Him, that life-changing knowledge of the kingdom will be granted to us as we make Jesus our focus. And Jesus says here, His promise is, we'll be given more and more. There's more than we could ever hope to grasp and see when we focus on Him and look to Him as the revealer of that truth to us. I'm excited to begin digging into these stories now in the coming weeks. Jesus was the one in this context revealing the stories, the purpose and the meaning of them. We know now God says he sent his spirit. Jesus said, when I go, I will send my spirit and he will be my interpreter. So we have him to be the one now to reveal his truth to us. Let's pray now and ask him to reveal his truth to us both today and in the coming weeks as we look at these stories together.